often forgotten, children at the crossroads of quality and culturally competent care. Brought to you by Ideal UCLA. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our faculty. I'm Mo Saeed Inishad. I'm a faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Harbor UCLA, and I'm also a faculty with Ideal UCLA. My name is Dennis Shea. I'm Director of Social Medicine and Community Health at Harbor UCLA and faculty with Ideal UCLA. Hi, my name is Hannah Janeway. I am the Ideal Fellow in the UCLA Department of Emergency Medicine. My name is Kane Preston Suni. I'm faculty at Greater Los Angeles VA and uh, within the Department of Ideal UCLA. Hi, I'm Hamang Acharya. I recently graduated the Ideal Fellowship with the UCLA Department of Emergency Medicine. Okay, so the objectives for this uh, program are uh, to have our participants learn how to appreciate all the social factors that influence healthcare delivery and outcomes for children. Um, also to be able to recognize the unique needs of specific vulnerable at risk children and also to be able to understand the challenges and solutions uh, from drawing from the expertise and experiences that we ourselves have had at the International Domestic Health Equity and Leadership Program, IDEAL at UCLA, as well as other contexts. And we're going to learn about potential strategies to create a community of practice that is not only able to provide high quality care, but also equitable and patient-centered care. So as far as outlines, so we're first going to talk about a little bit about what the definition of health equity is and how children are specifically affected by this. We'll talk a little bit about how early childhood experiences and exposures to show social injustice, things like poverty, homelessness, violence, and substance abuse can have lifelong effects on access to resources and ability to fully realize one's potential for achievement. We'll next look at children as specifically at risk part of the population and how the gaps in the healthcare systems in recognizing this adversely not just affects the children themselves, but also their families. We'll then look at the role of the healthcare providers in screening and recognizing health disparities and how they can potentially connect patients to social service resources. Um, then we'll look at uh, some potential strategies that can help healthcare practitioners and the entire community of practice acquire the necessary skills and competencies uh, to not only provide the care that is scientifically sound, but also a care that is culturally appropriate. And to do this, we'll discuss a little bit about the roles of policies and legislative efforts, as well as collaborations between the public sector and private sector and the healthcare providers. And finally, we'll share a little bit of our experiences working with the UCLA Ideal section and its fellowship training program, and close with um, having some potential future areas of growth and development. So social determinants are the most influential factor in the health outcome of children and adults. Social determinants by themselves account for more than genetics and environmental factors combined. Unfortunately, during our medical trainings, we receive very little education on social determinants and health equity. And we don't even really get a lot of education on trying to even understand or screen or identify cases where social inequity exists and what potential resources we have should we identify somebody who has specific social needs. And this is particularly a problem with children because their health and wellness is not at all in part of our normal evaluation of children. We also wanted to specifically understand that there are a specific group of children that are at least more at risk than others. Those would be children of immigrants, for example, children of, um, foster care facilities, uh, children who have incarcerated parents, and children who are homeless. So let's take a step back and just look at what is the definition of health equity? If we're trying to think of what does health equity mean and what is the purpose of it? Health equity is the right to have a physical and economic well-being. Looking at social determinants of health, as you can see on the slide, there are factors that can adversely affect outcomes. For example, if a family has no child care, they have to stay at home and they have to watch their kid. If the family is made up of a single parent, that only source of income is lost. So therefore they are not able to pay for living expenses, for their bills, for their groceries, and um, 
as a result of that, they might miss medication prescriptions for their asthmatic child, for example, and this impacts their care, incre increases the family stressors, affects the child's school performance, and contributes to the child's behavioral health issues. This is how a relatively healthy child otherwise is already cued in to have a adversity in terms of any kind of problems that they're gonna face in the future. Early childhood experiences and experiences determine long-term effects and well-being. When a child grows in poverty, he or she is essentially confined to a geographic area beyond which they can't expand. This is the specific neighborhoods that they're gonna be living in. Living in these kind of neighborhoods predisposes them to specific biases, discriminatory policing, and stereotypes. It makes it really difficult to attend, for example, certain types of schools. And uh, it makes them not be able to have individualized learning environment. In the home, also the stress is related to things like food insecurity, lack of internet access, and other resources can adversely affect their ability to explore and to excel. Not only is the child's aptitude and capacity not evaluated properly in these settings, but the limitations in opportunities and mentorship makes it difficult for a child to be supported in his or her own goals and dreams to be better positioned in life. It's important to note that equality and equity are not the same. As you can see in the right part of the slide, um, in the equality slide, every child has a bicycle and every bicycle looks the same. It's exactly the same bike. So they're equal, each person has a bike. In the equity world, a child does not have the same bike as another child because their need, their height, their weight is different. They're gonna have different abilities to ride a different kind of bike. So each person has their own specific needs that health equity is actually addressing. So equity on the other hand is when each person has what is best suited for them in order to develop. I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Acharya now that will continue a little bit more about why health equity is so important. Thanks, Mosa. To reiterate what Mo said, health disparities in children, health equity is related to racial, ethnic, gender, and socioeconomic class-based differences. And the effects of these disparities at an early age affect subsequent adult development. We know through research that poverty, low educational opportunities, structural racism, and environmental disparities all affect child health. Child health equity is rooted in the idea of human rights, fundamentally that is of social justice and that everyone has the right to achieve their full human potential. Children not achieving their full human potential is an injustice to their communities and to society as a whole. It represents a failure of our public policies and inequity. Recognizing these factors early on allows an opportunity for intervention and referral to resources for help. Promoting health equity means moving the structural obstacles to health, including a lack of power, lack of access to education, jobs, safe and healthy environments, and healthcare. So the American Academy of Pediatrics have put together a few factors that they've identified that can help with recognizing children at risk. These risk factors on the slide, as you can see, include living in severe and chronic poverty, being in the foster care system, living with violence, being from immigrant or refugee family, being uninsured with poor access to health services, being homeless or from a homeless family, um, exposure to incarceration or juvenile detention, um, and from racial and ethnic minority groups. The AAP didn't specifically mention sexual and gender minorities, but they obviously are also an at-risk population. Children who are affected by drug and alcohol abuse in their households and those that are disabled also are at risk. So we're looking at these factors, we can see that children can't really advocate for themselves in this situation. So us in the ED, their interaction with us in the health system, it represents a moment in their lives where a positive interaction could be made that improves their future life trajectory. One area that's been pretty well studied in pediatrics is adverse childhood experiences, which we've mentioned. These include the factors in the left column, which we mentioned so far, child abuse, neglect, mental illness, substance use in the household, domestic violence, incarcerated family members, familiar rejection, including LGBTQIA individuals, racism, violence, housing, and food instability. 
all of these factors have been correlated with increased future risk of many negative health outcomes. These include teen pregnancy, STIs, alcoholism, smoking, drug abuse, mental illness, medical illnesses like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, being a victim of intimate partner violence and suicide as well. And this again demonstrates how through no fault of their own, children can be set up for a poor future from an early age. Um, we know through the idea of uh, allostatic load, a uh, concept that's mentioned a lot in public health, that chronic stress in childhood increases inflammation, uh, impairs immune function, and contributes to poor mental health, and eventually worse physical health as a result in adulthood. We see that this harms brain development, uh, can dysregulate their emotional skills, self-regulation ability, and problem-solving ability. Um, there's been studies that also directly link poverty and racism to these issues, for example, in cases of asthma in unhealthy environments, lead paint exposures in old houses, and the ability to breastfeed in single parent households. Therefore, most interventions that we do, they're probably going to be most helpful for addressing the root causes, including improving early care and education and supporting the family unit and living situation. Looking at some of the gaps in the care of at risk children. So, Children who are at risk due to these adverse childhood exposures, they could be prone to more ED use. That might be because they have a limited ability to access their primary care doctor um, or just have low health literacy in general. On the flip side, a fear of the healthcare system could also lead to negative health effects, ranging from missed vaccinations to delayed care and very serious condition. Uh, there's a strong fear of the healthcare system that's well documented that can limit the use of appropriate care or care that patients are even entitled to. We especially see this in the case of the documented patients and LGBTQIA patients as well. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the idea of what is quality care and how does that fit in with culturally appropriate care. So first of all, in our health encounter, we can ask about some of these social determinant vital signs that we've mentioned, you know, asking about housing insecurity, food insecurity, exposures to violence, and also very important, which Dr. Jane Way is going to discuss later, is learning about implicit biases. Uh, quality and evidence-based practice is part of the solution, but also our treatment plan should be focused on the family's resources and barriers that are preventing them from adhering to a treatment plan. And this should be a part of high quality and culturally competent care as well. Um, also important is gauging the health literacy of our patients and their families. This is something that is missed a lot in medicine, especially in emergency medicine. We should look at improving our communication skills with these low literacy patients, including using techniques like uh, teach back and watching not to use too much medical jargon. And lastly, language interpretation has been well documented to affect health outcomes and adherence to treatment plans. And with that, I'm gonna pass on to Dr. Hannah Janeway. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Acharya. So what can health providers do in the emergency department given all of that? The next slides are really gonna be focusing on what we can do as clinicians and what we can do both inside and outside the hospital and the evidence behind that. So here are some very general things that then we'll kind of narrow down on further slides. First, screening. So. Screening for ACAs is acceptable and it's feasible and it's been pretty much shown to be pretty effective in the primary care setting, but can also be done in the emergency department. And we'll discuss this a little bit later. Um, we can also utilize and create referral systems that address the barriers to care that are exposed in the screening process. And I think this is really important because if we just screen without having referral systems, then our screening essentially becomes ineffective. We can learn about one's own community needs. What that means is learning about the community that we're serving, so in engaging with and learning from them. There are a lot of local community organizations that we can engage with in a community-based participatory research model and also just as individuals to try to understand what are the most pressing issues for the community and where would be the most high yield areas to actually intervene. It also can expose um, areas in which we're not doing as well in the emergency department and things that we can improve upon. 
So for instance, if you're treating a, a high number of immigrant patients, we can look at health literacy, we can look at language proficiency, translation in the emergency department and adherence to this, cultural norms, and then involve communities in a really complicated but co uh, comprehensive uh, assessment process and then engage with those same community organizations to implement solutions to things that we've come up with. And then lastly, and I think this is really important and obviously goes alongside of what Dr. Atreya was talking about above, which is um, doing work in understanding and addressing our own implicit and explicit biases. But more important, I think, even than that, or alongside of that, we really need to start recruiting providers with similar backgrounds or similar racial, um, ethnic, or language um, backgrounds to the patients that we're serving in our communities. And so this really requires investing in the recruitment of underrepresented minorities in medicine. In later slides, we're gonna discuss more research that illustrates how doing exactly that improves patient outcomes and adherence with treatment plans, as well as satisfaction with the healthcare system overall. And like I said, this is also in addition to addressing implicit bias and engaging in anti-racist work at all levels of the healthcare system. So in addition to those things that we can do as clinicians, I think it's also really important to emphasize that a lot of the uh, solutions or a lot of the interventions that we're gonna need to engage in are upstream interventions. And so we also need to engage in community and national level advocacy about issues that directly and indirectly influence health. And that includes advocacy against police violence, like we're seeing right now, and against the discriminatory criminal justice system. For instance, in Los Angeles, a group of providers supported community activists in trying to not have a ton of money, billions of dollars, go to a jail, but instead to invest that money in community health and in mental health services, and that actually was um, ultimately successful. Um, and also advocating for individual policies like fair housing policies and for, for large policies as well, such as uh, universal health care that really would provide access to all individuals, regardless of immigration status or uh, socioeconomic status. So first we're going to look at um, this seminal article that came out in pediatrics in 2015 that talks about addressing health disparities in children. And this was written by Cheng et al. And it's a review article in which they essentially argue that a clinicians play a very critical role in diagnosing and addressing child health disparities. And as we go through the slides, we're gonna talk about some of their recommendations and some of the articles that they cited in this review in order to bring everyone on the same page. So what can clinicians do? They kind of outline these uh, various areas where clinicians can engage. And those include diagnosing disparities in one's community and practice, as we talked about above. Diagnosing disparities in clinical counters and innovating new practice models. And those are essentially in innovations and other things that we can do in our hospitals to address these barriers to care. Becoming literate on health literacy. So this is the work that you, know, you do by reading and understanding the evidence, but also by engaging with communities to understand the barriers that they're facing and all the sorts of socioeconomic, racial, et cetera, um, influences that affect the social determinants of health and the particular community that you serve. Delve into your own unconscious and implicit biases. I think this is really important. We all have them. And so it's really important to be aware of what they are and how they can unintentionally come across to patients or affect our care that we provide to others. Ensuring a cultural equity in the workplace. So that means being a leader in the emergency department. So if you see someone doing something that is anti-equity in the workplace, it's our responsibility to A, model behavior, and to B, stop and educate our fellow coworkers, whether that's doctors, staff members, EMTs that come in. And you know, an example would that be, would be someone who is treating a patient differently because of their race, or purposely misgendering a person, or calling someone a derogatory name, very explicit things, but also really sometimes subtle things like, you know, um, if you have a particular patient, for example, um, a Latino child who comes in and is complaining of pain everywhere, you know, saying things like, oh, this child just has what all the adults in the Latino community have, which is total body dolor, that's actually understanding how that is a cultural and racial stereotype that is in itself racist and understanding how your biases and your buying into that concept might lead to poorer care and delayed pain medication for that child. So it's really looking into these things that we normalize all the time in the emergency department, but in turn really influence how we treat people unintentionally. 
And then advocating for efforts that address root causes of health disparities. And that was what I was talking about before, about really doing the work that we need to do upstream to try to advocate for large changes that can ultimately help our patients when they're not in the emergency department. So first we're gonna start with screening and identifying children at risk. This is one of the things that we've mentioned several times. And here um, we're just gonna illustrate one of the articles that we looked at, which was a food security um, article that looks at screening for hunger in the PDD. And screening for hunger has actually been one of the areas that has been shown to be really efficacious in trying to identify and actually intervene. So we all know that food security can lead to worse health. It can lead to increased health utilization and hospitalizations as a result, as well as nutritional deficiencies, particularly in children, that then can lead to poor academic performance, behavioral problems, et cetera. And um, this study found that those families that were food insecure were also less like, more, sorry, more likely to have issues with finances, stable employment, and reliable transportation. So it's clear that these kind of compound upon each other to create a disadvantaged childhood. The study also showed that the majority of emergency department staff agreed that knowing about this, knowing about a family's social risk factors would improve patient care. And they all agreed that the ED should be playing a role in addressing family social needs. And I think it's really hard, right? Like how do we do this in a way that makes sense in the emergency department and some not only screen as this study is indicating, but also address those food insecurities um, in a way that's meaningful and not just, you know, here's two cans of food. So there are some health systems like Kaiser that are starting to look at these as part of their standardized uh, system of care by screening and then also referring to outside organizations for intervention. But there's a lot more work to be done and I think a lot of creativity that will have to happen even though it's sometimes very difficult to study um, the actual outcomes of interventions. So now I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Um, Kian Preston Suni, who's gonna talk about the role of the clinician and quality and culturally competent care. Thanks, Dr. Jaylai. Um, so as was alluded to earlier, the origins of health disparities are multifactorial with structural racism causing the unequal distribution of resources um, that are required to achieve health success and comfort. Uh, disparities also result from unequal treatment at the interpersonal level as a result of implicit biases and challenges with intercultural communication and language differences. Children of racial and ethnic minority groups do not receive the same care as white children. Uh, among children with long bone fractures, for example, as is seen in this paper, Black and Latino children are less likely to receive opiate pain medications and less likely to receive, achieve optimal pain control um, when compared with white children. This is only one of many documented healthcare disparities experienced by children. Uh, importantly, physicians who represent the communities of their patients have been shown time and again not to exhibit this differential treatment and show improved communication and patient-centered care. So recruiting physicians who are underrepresented in medicine will improve care for these patients. Uh, but in addition to recruiting physicians um, from URM groups, um, departments should also be examining themselves, um, the hospital and healthcare systems for evidence of differential treatment of children at risk due to their race, uh, ethnicity, or the language of parents. Um, in doing this, you can ensure that health equity is baked into departmental quality improvement efforts. Another example of a challenge commonly faced in the emergency department, when we prescribe asthma medications after an ED visit, we don't always take into account the unique patient needs, the home environment, social stressors, or community factors. And we're also unable to address from the department the structural racism that makes the air pollution that leads to asthma more common in minority neighborhoods. We also don't always know what challenge the patient and family has to overcome. We simply want the patient to adhere to treatment. We often don't know if the patient or family um, understands instructions. Unless probed, we might be clueless about any important cultural context. So always make sure to elicit the family's understanding of the illness. Uh, a shared conception of illness between the family and the physician 
is an important step in determining a mutually agreeable treatment plan that the family and patient will be able to adhere to. Um, it's been shown before uh, that physicians and nurses are poor at assessing, at assessing health literacy, and many families are afraid to ask for clarification uh, because of stigma and shame. So don't rely on your own assessment of your patient's understanding. Instead, use health literacy universal precautions. Speak clearly using simple jargon-free language and confirm understanding with the teach-back technique. Departments should be equipped to meet their patients where they're at. So adequate staffing with social work and case management can help bring the right resources to the families who most stand to benefit from them. Technological solutions can also help. Um, one example of this is um, One Degree, um, which functions like Yelp for social services with an intuitive interface that streamlines the process of determining eligibility for uh, social resources. Primary care follow-up is also often difficult for socially vulnerable patients. By ensuring partnerships with primary care clinics, Departments, emergency departments can provide a method for establishing care um, for people who lack a PCP and might be behind on vaccinations, well child screening, and other uh, routine preventive outpatient care. Um, children, importantly in the ED, uh, we're often going to be seeing children involved in the child welfare system. Um, these kids are at risk for poor achievement and outcomes, as well as behavioral health problems, and have high rates of ED utilization. They're at risk due to family separation and high rates of concurrent social risk factors for a lack of role modeling and the resources needed to overcome the challenges that they're more likely to face to begin with. Children in the child welfare system might not be as likely to have a primary medical home, and EDs should be equipped for the unique needs of these at-risk children. Black, Latino, and Native children are overrepresented in foster care um, and at particular risk for poor psychosocial outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, the input of these communities has been lacking in the development of child welfare programs, uh, which remains underexplored in the literature and is an area for future work. So uh, uh, the interventions we've discussed so far um, are supported by numerous pro professional organizations who've released policy statements supporting health equity, physician advocacy, and screening for social, social risk factors and adverse childhood events. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Shia, who's gonna share what we do from here on out. Thank you very much, Ken. So I think we've heard a lot about going from the structural to screening to what providers can do to think about culturally competent care to actually accessing resources. But I think it's a lot when we think about systems change. We're hearing about problems of structural racism, structural violence, and poverty. These are not easy issues for any one provider to solve. So I'd like to really talk a little bit about what, where you should go as an emergency medicine provider when you back, go back to your home institution. So here we like to introduce the idea of IDEAL UCLA, the International Domestic Health Equity and Leadership section at UCLA. And this is a section that really is something you can start with at your institution. At, for IDEAL, we brought together faculty who are interested in various aspects of these issues to work together to think through how do we educate residents, medical students, attendings, and other fellows, and participate in a meaningful way forward, both in terms of research as well as implementation science, where we develop programs, study them, and really try to push forward at both an individual provider level, a local systems level, and a national level, providing evidence and examples of how to address these structural and social determinants of health to ensure that kids, adults, and their families everywhere are able to achieve equity. So in this section, just really wanted to talk a little bit about highlighting some of our programs. One of the programs 
to highlight is the food pharmacy. So as Dr. Jane Wayne mentioned earlier, screening for food is a very simple way that many emergency departments can go about identifying patients who are vulnerable, who have, um, who sort of have food security as an indicator of many underlying problems and challenges that they face. And the question is, what do you do after you screen for food? Of course, you can refer to local resources such as food banks. For those families or in, in children who are eligible, you can help them enroll in benefits such as food stamps or in California, CalFresh. But longer term, what else can we do? What we found at Harbor and in LA is that despite many families having access to food banks, being enrolled in CalFresh, which is our version of food stamps, they still remain food insecure. And this is where we came together with the idea of working with our communities, really digging deep, trying to minimize waste and leverage the existing resources to better serve our patients. We partnered with Food Forward, which is a local nonprofit that does food recovery at the downtown LA markets for excess produce that would otherwise be thrown away and gone to waste, as well as with the American Heart Association to transport the food down to Harbor so that we can have our providers across emergency departments, as well as their pediatricians in the family medicine and outpatient settings, prescribe these children and families food so that it serves as a supplement and also a healthy way to address their food insecurity. Because as we know, not only are these families very vulnerable, but they leave, live in situations such as areas of South, South Los Angeles that have poor access to food or food deserts where the only available produce to them is from a liquor store or corner store that does not stock fresh produce. So in doing this project, we leveraged community partners as well as our hospital infrastructure to really try to bring what patients need to them in the healthcare setting so they don't have to deal with other challenges such as transportation to access these foods. Other examples of this would be the work that we're doing around asylum evaluations um, as Kian mentioned, many of our patients, especially those with marginal um, documentation statuses, are often very high at risk because of different barriers they face, not just fear, but also, but also lack of access to benefits. So one thing that our providers have been trained to do is working with experts to become medical experts for asylum evaluations to really support children and their families in the process of gaining, legit, leg, gaining documentation status in this country so then they can access other additional benefits in order to stabilize their situation and address the underlying issues that affect their health. On the international front, there's a lot of work that's being done in different areas through Project SAMIA and Community Partners International looking to take some of the work that's being done locally and spreading it down to mostly Central South America because we, especially in LA, we see a continuum of migration, a continuum of care for our patients as they often travel between Los Angeles and different areas in Central and South America. So I think in terms of next steps, outside of starting a section where you can begin to design curriculum, do education at your institution, is really thinking through big picture wise, what should we do as a community? As Hannah mentioned, the pipeline recruitment of providers who understand these issues, who come from the communities that our patients come from, is a big need. And at Ideal UCLA and at Harbor UCLA, we've really championed the idea of diversity and inclusion in our recruitment. Obviously, education of all providers, no matter what their background, is also super important. And through IDEAL, we've created a curriculum for both residents and medical students to learn about different, ed different areas of social determinants of health and health equity so that they can be better prepared to take care of our patients. And as both Haman and Kia mentioned, screening for social needs in the ED, once you have providers who understand the importance of this, is not a big stretch. And screening can take the many forms, including using technology, as we're piloting here at Harbor, using a chat bot, think Alexa or Siri, to ask patients the questions so that this does not take away from valuable provider time, 
And once social needs are identified, naturally then working through systems such as One Degree, as Ken discussed, in partnership with social work and our community partners to address patient social needs. And I think, once again, the key here is not just using existing resources, which is a good start, but also thinking creatively outside the box and as a provider, working with your community, working with your community-based organizations to come up with creative ways to increase access to resources and address the disparities in your community. And then obviously, lastly, I think we've seen all through COVID-19 that the disparities, the challenges around housing insecurity, individuals experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, unemployment are all aggravated, really highlighting the under underlying structural challenges in our communities. And I think that's where we have to come together as a community to really advocate on behalf of our patients to ensure that we, in this challenging time of budget cuts, that resources are really dedicated to our communities and that we continue to push forward on policies that support bring resources and taking care of our communities. I think many people have discussed defunding the police, which comes off as a controversial statement. However, I think this is sort of one policy angle that bears a lot deeper analysis and holds a lot of promise. Just because traditionally we've relied on policing and incarceration to address many of the social issues, such as individuals experiencing homelessness, individuals with substance use disorder, individuals with mental health. But we know that policing and incarceration just adds to the trauma these individuals have. And what we really need to do is take the resources and ask, ask individuals to work at the top of their license and support them to do so, so that we have resources to support our mental health provider, our homeless services providers. And that way, the police are not asked to address all these issues in a way that they're ill-equipped to do and do in a way that is extremely expensive and bad for the patient. So in conclusion, emergency physicians have an important role in identifying social determinants of health and health equity issues in patients, because often families, especially vulnerable families, come to the emergency department for a whole number of reasons, but they come in because they're having an emergency. Often that's not necessarily a traditional medical or biological emergency, but truly a social or health equity emergency. And by training our providers appropriately, screening and referring and partner with our community partners appropriately, and advocating at the state, the local, and the national level, can we really help and hope to achieve health equity across our populations and across the United States. Thank you all very much.